back in the 60s during the Vietnam War, there was a draft. So if you weren't in school or you weren't uh, other things, if you weren't uh, messed up physically in some way or you weren't gay, if you could say you were gay, you could get out of the draft and not have to go to war maybe, not have to go to Vietnam, maybe, and uh, so, you know, I was, uh, I was eligible for this because uh, I was still, the war was still going on when I got uh, out of high school, and I was not in the, uh, in school. Uh, fortunately, I got a good lottery number, so I didn't have to go through all this stuff that's uh, in the song here by Phil Oaks. Phil Oaks was the major uh, protest songwriter and singer during the Vietnam War. And, at, at, uh, well, I think it might have been still going on when he died. But um, he was the one that was really committed and was out there. And, uh, you know, he started out as a journalist and he was very committed to the anti war movement and to uh, basically. <laughs> the socialist revolution that kind of rose out of it because people could see what uh, was happening with their country with these uh, corporate uh, hacks running everything. So I uh, got to see Phil Oaks late in his career uh, in, here in New York City at Max's Kansas City, which is a famous club way back when, and uh, <clears throat> he was uh, it, it did a show, a uh, solo show, and opening for him was Patti Smith. So uh, I'd never even heard of Patti Smith before, but I saw her that night with Phil Oaks. It was a late show. Uh, it was very crowded, and uh, I was seated on stage with... Um, with Phil Oaks, basically, <laughs> and Patti Smith. So. Um, this song is uh, the song Phil Oaks wrote about the uh, draft dodgers. It's called Draft Dodger Rag. Well, I'm just a typical American boy from a typical American town. I believe in God, Senator Todd, keep an old Castro down. When it came my time to serve, I knew better dead than red. When I got to the old draft board, oh, this is what I said. Sarge, I'm only a teen, I got a ruptured spleen, and I always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, and my feet are flat, and my eyes moves getting worse. Think of my career, my sweetheart dear, my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool, I'm a go with the and I'm working in a defense plant. I got a dislocated disc and a racked up black, and I'm allergic to flowers and bugs. When a bombshell hits, I get epileptic fits, and I'm addicted to a thousand drugs. I got the weakness woes, can't touch my toes, I can barely reach my knees. And if the enemy gets close to me, I'll probably start to sneeze. Sarge, I'm only Spleen and I always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, and my feet are flat. My asthma's getting worse. Oh, think of my career, my sweetheart, dear, my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool. I'm going to school and I'm working in the defense plan. I hate Joe and Lie, and I hope he dies. But there's one thing you gotta see. Someone's gotta go over there, but that someone isn't me. So I wish you well, Sarge. Give him hell. Kill me a thousand or so. And if you ever get a war without blood and gore, I'll be the first to go. Sarge, I'm only 18. I got a ruptured spleen, and I always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, and my feet are flat, and my asthma's getting worse. I think of my career, my sweetheart dear, my poor old invalid aunt. I ain't no fool, I'm going to school and I'm working a defense plan. 
so that's uh, Draft Dodger Rag by Phil Oaks. This is all as a little introduction to a um, book I read uh, called Because Our Fathers Lied. Here it is. Because Our Fathers Lied. It is written by Craig, it's a new book, written by Craig McNamara, who was the son of Robert McNamara, who was the uh, defense secretary uh, from the Kennedy years in through the Johnson years from 1961 to uh, 1968. And uh, the boy, Craig, was the last of his children. Uh, he is around my age, actually. And uh, he had a a lot of different life than I did. Uh, I was a son of a steel worker in Ohio and he was uh, at the top of the heap, uh, the son of this, uh, basically this warrior, this uh, guy that uh, sent people off and, you know, uh, signed off, uh, designed the bombing missions. He, uh, Robert McNamara came out of uh, the Ford Motor Company, he was the president of the Ford Motor Company. And before he became uh, secretary of the defense, called in by Kennedy for this job. And Kennedy said, do you want to be uh, defense or finance? And somehow he decided to take defense instead of finance. Finance might have been a little cleaner. I don't know. At any rate, uh, I don't need to hear myself anymore. Um, so he went to um, Washington. Oh, he, uh, Craig talks about the, the nice days when they lived in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And Dad would take off to what, uh, Dearborn or wherever uh, the Ford stuff was going on in his uh, zippy 60s era. Thunderbird, uh, and you know his dad was this sort of, a, I guess, kind of a swinging guy for that kind of a era at, at that time. But um, he always was this kind of severe-looking guy with you know, his hair all swept back and uh, wire rim glasses, and uh, you know he came from Harvard. All these, all these kinds of things, <clears throat> and. The book, uh, Craig was born uh, a year or so before me, so he was a Vietnam-era child as well. Um, and he got swept up by the anti-war movement, ca largely caused because of the draft, because there were so many uh, young, white, uh, you know, upper working class or middle class people who happened to get swept up in this and uh, off onto the war and into the war machine. So Craig was one of those and uh, he, you know, he went to all his elite schools. And, well, he went to, an, yeah, he went to Stanford later but, and dropped out. But uh, the, the book is uh, a lot of him coming to terms with his father. He, he, uh, he talks about how he wanted his father to basically you know, apologize, really come forward uh, with what, you know, he, what the hell he, he brought. I mean, he questions whether his father was a war criminal. And well, his father, yes, was a war criminal in my mind uh, and in the minds of many other people. He was the subject of uh, Fog of War by Errol Morris, a movie I haven't yet watched. And uh, I don't think I'm going to watch it. I don't need to see him sit there and say, empathize with the enemy when did he empathize with the enemy that he was bombing the uh the so maybe he emph emph emphasized with the leaders um uh, but he didn't emphasize with uh, the regular people on the ground he just uh, or the american soldiers that he sent over there to uh, walk around through the jungles and in the heat and uh kill 
all these people. There was, you know, all this. Oh, uh, so Seymour Hirsch has just written a, 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 a thing on Substack. Seymour, Seymour Hirsch, a legendary um, journalist about uh, other lies of our system uh, currently. Uh, Seymour Hirsch was the man who exposed the My Lai Massacre, which was when Lieutenant Cowley and his uh, troops went in and slaughtered all these people in a village. He was later put on trial. Uh, uh, it was exposed to everyone, and, uh, you know, we found out, you know, more of the horror that was going on in Vietnam in our name. So, Craig has uh, dropped out of school, and with some of his buddies, it, the, actually the most interesting part of the book is Craig's adventures and what Craig was like and what Craig did uh, with his youth. Um, he got on some motorcycles with a couple of his uh, friends, BMWs, that they bought somehow, and they headed to Mexico uh, with the intention of riding the motorcycles all the way to the bottom of South America. His friends dropped out, I think, in uh, somewhere along the line, uh, maybe uh, Colombia, maybe a little bit before, I don't remember. His friends dropped out. And Craig ended up s hitchhiking in South America on his own and went down to uh, Chile. Uh, this is Ale um, Salvador Allende's Chile, uh, which was, you know, attempting to be socialist, which, of course, the United States didn't like and uh, ended up uh, deposing him and killing all these people and bringing in uh, Pinochet, who was the leader ruler with, ruler with this fascist system for uh, many years. Craig um, went to Easter Island, which I found out is part of um, Chile, and owned by Chile, or at least was back then, and which is out, you know, in the Pacific, uh, off the coast of Chile and he got all into a uh, farming he lived in a cave there and uh, he got all into farming and working with his hands uh, and he wanted to be a farmer and ultimately he did become a farmer and he uh, spent his life uh, as a um, farm owner a walnut uh, farm owner in California somewhere and, um, you know, going doing pretty well at that. Uh, how did he get the farm? Well, his dad bought the farm, which might be a reason why a lot of time is spent in the book saying how he loved his father uh, in spite of what he did. And I was... I was like, well, why exactly does he love his father? Did he love his father? You know, it, it, they went on, you know, his father was busy, you know, off doing, running the war, uh, being involved in government. After, the, after that, he headed the World Bank. So he was all this big, big time capitalist stuff going on with him. While uh, Craig was, you know, kind of, hungering for attention you know come and come and meet my uh see the farm that you bought his dad bought it for him uh on loan and he says he eventually paid it back but you know i i wondered how he uh whether you know he has children himself now and i <laughs> i don't know if he just feels like he has to carry the banner for family and love your father because he, he says many times that he loved his father. And uh, I'm, well, why did you love your father? He wasn't around that much. Uh, he, he did, uh, he, he did, um, he took them, uh, he, they all went, camp the family went on these, you know, obviously very expensive uh, mountain camping trips for like a week or so. 
all through uh, his childhood, even when his dad was attorney general. And he talks about going on these trips and how, you know, that was really the main connection he had with his father. Um, <laughs> his mother died before his father. And she says that uh, on her deathbed, she talks to Craig and she says, you know, don't, don't you live your life for someone else. She was really a, 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 um, one of these old school wives who uh, sacrificed her life for her, for her husband. Um, she did her own thing, I guess, after all the children were out with, with the, you know, the high profile that they had in Washington. She started reading is fundamental. Uh, you probably heard of reading is fundamental. I did back in the day. I don't know if it's still a thing, but, you know, uh, encouraged reading among children, learning to read, uh, literacy. Well, that's, that's good. That's a noble thing. So, but he... On his deathbed, on her deathbed, she says, "You know, don't, don't, um, you know, don't live your life for someone else. Live your life for yourself." And uh, I think Craig basically did, but still, he has this longing for his father. His father went to Vietnam. And he wanted to go to Vietnam with his father. His father refused to let him go. Um, another another uh, kid of, of you know, uh, Katzenbach, uh, the grandson of Katzenbach or something, he got to go. And Craig like, well, why don't I get to go? Um, this is after the war, you know, more in the 80s. <clears throat> oh, he tells a story about uh, another of these... Uh, children, uh, the son of Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk was what? Uh, I forget. Secretary of State, maybe. And uh, he had a son called, I think his name was Bill, who um, Craig was going to go to Vietnam with at a later date. They were both going to go together. And, but Bill uh, jumped off a bridge before they went together, and he he had uh, treated the whole thing much differently. He cut off and didn't talk to his father for years and years and years, where Craig is always, you know, trying to get closer to his father. Uh, his father did invite him to uh, the premiere of uh, Fog of War at Sundance, so he talks about that a little bit, but, you know, he, he also, you know, prohibited him from participating in everything about that. So um, he was just not that, that um, open to his son. And so there's a lot of this sorrow in that, that his father didn't love him as much as he loved his father, really. So that's the, really the, the essence of, of the book. Uh, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. It was a fast read. I, I read it in record time. I, I picked it up at the library. It was in the New York Public Library. I was going for fiction. I was going to go upstairs. And I walked in, and uh, there was this book. And I said, oh, um, maybe, I should, maybe I should read that. Uh, so I went upstairs and got a couple of fiction things and came down while I was upstairs. I, All right, I'll pick it up if it's still down there when I come down. It was. And, um, you know, he he's seemed like a really decent guy, like what he did in Chile, his experiences, as I said, with that. <laughs> he also talks about this kind of um, triangular relationship he had. At that, he, he met these, uh, he calls them Argentinian hippies in uh, Chile in the early, early 70s. And uh, he went... They were a couple, Carmen and I don't remember his name, but he ended up really clicking with this Carmen. He fell in love with her, basically. And they wrote to each other all the time. He was out in uh, Easter Island, and he met up with her later. Um, 
I think she, something happened to her. She had an accident or something, and uh, her her uh, her um, other her husband. I think they were married. Her, her spouse came, and uh, he talks a lot about this woman. Very little about his wife. Very little about his sisters. His older sisters. I guess they didn't really want to be included. But he has his wife Julie, and he later went on to have some children. Uh, so, you know, it it. Uh, Because our fathers lied. It's an interesting little um, 260 some pages of this memoir about a ruling upper class kid who, uh, due to the, the issues of the, of the 60s, um, kind of led a different life. Uh, and, you know, it, it's admirable. He seems like a, a decent guy. He, um, there's something else I wanted to say about this. Maybe I'll do it in another take. Oh, there's a lot of difference uh, that happened out of the Vietnam War. The whole Vietnam era was on TV. Uh, they had the draft. Since then... All the wars have been fought by technology, uh, by mercenaries, and by the poor. The de industrial, the children of de industrialized America, the people out in Ohio, the kind of people that I grew up with, their children are still going into the military because uh, they. The, the, I guess they still believe in the military, and the parents do in a sense, but or else the, you know they just don't have any other. You could go to college quite uh, inexpensively back in the day in Ohio when I was a kid, and but you can't do that now. You can go work at Walmart, I guess. You can you know do this and that. You can you know get in draw, involved with uh, uh, you know meth and. Uh, Oxycodone, uh, uh, heroin. Um, so it's interesting to me how the war machine has, has all kind of been hidden from us. Uh, United States was capable of going for you know twenty years in Afghanistan and did all these other things. Uh, didn't win anything just, you know, killed a lot of people, wasted a lot of money, uh, sent people homeless, uh, packing from their home, refugees, you know, millions of refugees, uh, all the deaths. And there's not a big anti-war movement uh, in the United States. One, because there's no draft. Two, because it's hidden. They embedded some soldiers during the Iraq War. Uh, they embed, they, they make you go with the, uh, the reporters, they make you go with the military units um, and keep control over what you're doing and what you're saying. And they are, have a tight control over what goes on, plus the news media has changed. Uh, this, is a, this is written in, in there's a book called... Um, the Death of the Liberal Class by Chris Hedges that talks a lot about how the liberal class used to push some more radical things, but the liberal class is now just completely mainstream, centrist, or, you know, somewhat right, um, which means that there is, you know, the, the Red Scare wiped out a lot of them, uh, job losing jobs in uh, this and that industry sent them a lot of them into being uh, good good boys good boys and girls so they could keep their jobs uh, playing along um, so the, the country has changed a great deal and um, 
from that time, and, and people really don't know what it was like back then. Um, it's not like that now, and you know, a lot of us are kind of frightened that this is this all this war machine is just going to go on and on. I mean, they're really going to start intimidating China more, and you know, we we don't do anything about it um, because we're not led to do anything about it by uh, a liberal class that that was still kind of you know a little bit involved in it in the Vietnam, even though the Vietnam War went on for over 10 years and 40,000, uh, I think 40,000 Americans and about, you know, a million, a million 300,000 is what I read in one Wikipedia page. So anyway, they spend more on the military than ever, the military industrial complex. It bugs me. I'm old. You're going to have to deal with it. I don't know what you're going to do. You're just going to live with it, I guess, because it seems to be not stoppable unless they blow us all up or the U.S. gets some kind of comeuppance. And that might be rough for all of us living here when they uh, stop using the dollar and uh, various other things that are going on as we alienate all the rest of the world with our nonsense. So, I think I've spoken enough. Uh, please like and subscribe. Um, that would be lovely. Then I could make more of these crazy videos for you and uh, you could hear me rant about things you don't want to hear. And if you, don't, if you don't like me, well, that's tough because I'm speaking my mind and the truth that I have from my experience as limited as it is but the truth of what it really is because our fathers lied by Craig McNamara, McNamara a memoir of truth and family from Vietnam to today thanks for watching <laughs> Well, come on, all we big, strong men. Two, two, two. Both families are help again. We got a self and a table champ. Way down two, yonder two. in Vietnam. So put down your books, pick up a gun. We're gonna have a whole lot of fun. And just one, two, three. What do we fight one, for? Two. Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. Two, two. And it's five, six, seven, open up the church again. Well, ain't no time to wonder why we're we'll all gonna die. Well, come on, General, let's move fast. Big chance is coming at last. You gotta go out and get those friends. The only two commies, one who's dead in the woods. There'll only be one when we blow them all with kingdom come And just one, two, three, what do we fight for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn Next stop is Vietnam And just five, two, six, seven, open up the pearly gates Oh, ain't no time to wonder why we'll be, we're all gonna die Come on, boys, don't be slow, you know this war is a go, go, go. But there's money to be made, supplying the army with the tools and the strains. Just to pray when they drop the bomb, they can drop it on the Viet Cong. And this one, two, three, what do we fight for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is two, two. And this five, two, six. Seven, open up the gates. Well, ain't no time to wonder why we'll be. We're all gonna die. But come on, mother, we drop the van. Send the boys up to the end. Come on, father, don't hesitate. Send the boys before it's too late. First one on the blocks, tap your boy, come home in a box. And it's one, two, three, 
What do we fight for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Sex stop is yes, damn. And it's five, six, seven. Open up, turn the game. Well, ain't no time to wonder why. Oh, ain't no time to wonder why. Oh, ain't no time to wonder why. Oh, ain't no time to wonder why. Whoopee, we're all gonna die. Open it.